All right, let's get the stream started. Um, thank you for that host, Matricula. And yeah, we'll be seeing this picture again, but it is, it is a very pretty view from one of St. Petersburg's canals. Hello, hi, welcome. Um, so this week we are in, in Tales from Afar, we are in St. Petersburg and I decided to not try and cram all of this into one week because I have way too much, way too much, um, because I'm, I cannot control myself at museums especially if they are museums with um, Greek and Roman antiquities in them. Yeah, so this week we're in St. Petersburg looking at canals and some really mind-blowing churches. I mean, we've seen some good churches, y'all, but... but you know how they say that everything's bigger in Texas? I, I feel like some things really are just kind of bigger and more impressive and on a grander scale in Russia. So, or at least in St. Petersburg. I can't speak for any other part of Russia. Um, so we'll be seeing a little bit of the city today, seeing some amazing churches, pretty canals. And then next week is going to be a full-on museum week with um, a lot of mythical creatures, a lot of uh, a lot of you know sideline stories as we go. So let's get started. Um, we had two days in Saint Petersburg just for some context. Uh, however, however, because relations are weird right now, right? We either had to have gotten a visa before we went, if we wanted to do anything on our own in the city, or um, we could only go on official supervised tours. So everything you'll see is from one of the three tours that we, that we took. Um, the first day we went to the Hermitage early in the morning. That was half the day right there. And frankly, I was done after that. And that was a lot. Um, we did a, a bus tour with some photo stops included uh, that afternoon as well. And then the next day we did a canals and churches tour where we cruised the canals and actually got to go in a couple of the more impressive churches. So um, I'm changing up orders a little bit. We're going to, to look at a, a mixture of, of things from both days. Um, but this, is, this picture right here is the view from the beginning of our canal cruise. And you know, when, when I think of canals, I think of Venice, I think of Amsterdam. Hi, Lee, Dinale, hi, yay. I'm so glad you could make it. Um, I hope you have your earphones in because I make no promises about my cussing or lack thereof. Um, yay. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm happy to have you hanging out. Um, so yeah, this is, this right here is the view from, um, from the top of the canal boat, looking out into the canal just as we got going. And you can see some of the more picturesque older buildings along the side of the canal. You can see, um, an art installation of some birdies up here. It was very pretty. It was very cold. They had blankets for us. We used the blankets. It was very chilly. 
um, but also very pretty. And right, what I was what I was kind of getting at was I hadn't thought of St. Petersburg as a city of canals before. But it really is. We got around and saw quite a lot of the city by water. Um, and for, for my money, it, that's a much nicer way to see it than by boat. Uh, so that's where we started. And then this again is, um, from the water. Actually, actually I lie. This is not from our canal cruise. This is of a canal, but was from one of the photo stops on our bus. Um, <laughs> why Lee? Lee? I am a canal. Ich bin ein Kanaler. Okay. No, I, I don't know any Russian, so I'm not going to try and say that I am a canal in Russian. Um, although, oh, oh, are you making, are you making, are you making a pastry joke? Here as well, ich bin ein Kanel, like like the the cream filled pastries. <sighs> Lee, Lee, so much rambling. Okay, all right. <laughs> we did not have any pastries in Russia. We were not pastries in Russia. However. <laughs> However, we saw um, this is a picture of an old refurbished sailing ship, which I thought was pretty cool. In front of, in front of a uh, an older building, I have no idea what the building is, but but that just gives you an idea of how actually very pretty the water in the canals was, and um, the the boat was very pretty too. I think there's a restaurant in it now because that's what you do with old boats when you refurbish them. And then, um, I don't remember which part of the trip this was from, but this is a distance photo of the great mosque of St. Petersburg, which just clearly I cropped this because we couldn't really zoom in. We were, in transit and it was hard to get a good picture um, but just from seeing this from a distance I really wish we'd been able to see this up close I mean look at that gorgeous teal tile work those are some really pretty domes some lovely minarets lovely lines happening here and I I wish we'd been able to see that. Um, but even so, it's nice to know that there is a, a big, beautiful mosque in St. Petersburg. And then because we've been talking about, um, about civic, civic cultus and the ways that Greek and Roman deities in particular just keep showing up in kind of a patron capacity in civic architecture. Um, I wanted to share this. This is from the Stock Exchange in St. Petersburg. And obviously, well, hopefully obviously, this is a picture of Poseidon or Neptune um, with his horses and his attendants and his trident. Uh, and that's because while Poseidon and Neptune don't necessarily, he doesn't necessarily have anything to do with stocks and trading, but for a port town, for a town with a lot of canals, he certainly has a lot to do with trade and prosperity. If your trade comes from the ocean, you want to be on Poseidon's good side. So here he is presiding over the stock exchange um, and looking very weather-beaten, actually, all 
all beaten up. Uh, but this is also interesting because it's it's an example of something we'll talk about more when we get to one of the churches we're going to look at. St. Petersburg is by design, as Russian cities go, a fairly Western city. Um, Peter the Great constructed St. Petersburg, brought in European architects, brought in European designers, really, excuse me, wanted to bring, um, it was kind of a keeping up with the Joneses thing, wanted to bring Russia into the larger European community, um, and show that you know, we're we're just as good. We're just as good. We can we can be civilized and have culture and and uh, use the Greek gods and goddesses too. Um, yes, Matricula. Peter had a Western boner. He really really wanted those Western countries to the rest of Europe to take a look and be like, oh oh oh. What a, what a nice country you are over there. That's a, that's a nice country. Except, as we know, clearly, nice countries don't get the girls. Is that how that works? Anyway. Um, so it's the stock exchange. Very interesting. And then, this is the palace square, right outside the Winter Palace. You know, large, um, not compensating for anything, clearly, column in the middle of it. Buildings all around it. Uh, as, as we're facing the view that we have here, behind us is the Winter Palace, which is part of the Hermitage, that huge museum that we'll look at lots of things from next week. Um, but yeah, so as we as we exited the Hermitage, we walked out onto this square, which is pretty impressive all on its own. You've got the the buildings surrounding it, the obelisk in the middle. But also, it's hard to tell who this crowd is here. But the crowd to the left of the obelisk, um, they're they're bystanders kind of to the right. And to the left of the obelisk is a military band and they were rehearsing they were singing something they were prepping for a festival um i think it might have been or it was an early may festival maybe may the 5th i don't remember what what exactly that festival was about but they were prepping for a festival so that was really kind of neat to see um I did not include the photo from just a little after this of furries in the wild in St. Petersburg, but, but there was Chip and Dale too. So churches, to start all of the churches that we're going to look at today are Russian Orthodox. We did not in St. Petersburg, I mean, there are lots of different kinds of churches, but um, my feeling is that if you want impressive churches in St. Petersburg or in Russia in general, you don't bother with any except the Russian Orthodox churches. So all of these are Russian Orthodox. But they are all very different, very, very different, both inside and outside. Um, this first one, was, was just kind of a, an incidental stop on a longer trip. And this is St. Nicholas's Naval Cathedral. Not, not naval, but boats and navy, right? We've seen a couple of other in, um, I believe in France and maybe in Portugal. We saw a couple of other churches that were geared towards sailors, towards naval life. Um, and this is one of those. As you can see, it is a lovely pastel blue. There is a lot, there are a lot of pastel buildings 
in St. Petersburg. And it's kind of weird to me. Um, like it makes sense. It seems to fit the culture. When I was in towns like Lisbon, towns like Porto, towns like Cadiz, these kind of sunny Mediterranean areas, coastal town, touristy town. And I imagine that's what St. Petersburg was trying to emulate, but it's, it's very kind of weird to be in Russia, which I think of as having a much kind of more serious and um, somber, really, demeanor and, and cultural feeling and see all these pastel buildings light blue, light green, toshu pink, all of the toshu pink. Um, that's a, that's, that's a technical term. You, you'd understand if you were a ballet dancer. But anyway, very typical coloration. And this doesn't have, last week in Tallinn we looked at, um, Nevsky Cathedral. Um, I, exactly, Lee. It's a it's a dancer thing. You, <laughs> well, really, it's, really, it's just it's just the kind of super light peachy pink that most point shoes and a lot of ballet tights are. And uh, ballet pink, I feel like, is a pinker pink. Than Toshu pink. Like ballet pink is what people think of. Think that tutus and such should be. And Toshu pink is the lighter and peachier color that I feel like most, the largest portion of Toshus and ballet tights tend to actually be. So I, I might be wrong. It has been a long time since I've been in the dance world. To that level but when i was when i was a wee little thing that was how it worked also my my first dance teacher's house was very much toshu pink and we all gave her grief for it in the most loving way possible um yeah so this doesn't have the onion domes or the kind of architectural features that we saw in on Nevsky Cathedral in Tallinn last week. It's still very grand, still, but it feels, at least the outside to me, feels more Baroque, it feels more Western. I don't have any pictures of the inside here because this is a working church. This is the only one of the churches we're gonna see today that really is a working church. Um, there was a small service going on on one side when we were in there. There were people praying, there were people in and out. Um, and they had signs that very clearly said, no pictures. So no pictures. But it was very much like the, um, the couple of pictures that I showed you last week of the inside of the cathedral in Tallinn. It was, you know, very used, kind of dim, very full of icons, of um, people, of spaces for devotion, of candles, and it was incense, and, and it was really beautiful. It was a really beautiful place to be. Um, we didn't have as long here as I would have liked, but it was beautiful. So in some ways, the outside of this is very Baroque, the inside is very much what I came to expect from an Orthodox church. So, St. Nicholas's. First. Next, this is St. Isaac's. As you can see, totally different. Totally different. This framing does not really give you a um a sense of scale but these columns are huge they are gi fucking enormous just 
uh, uh, tree trunks, tree trunk columns and big tree trunks, not like, not the tulip poplar outside my house tree trunks, but like, super old growth, just huge. The, it's, it was really hard, even in person, to really kind of grasp the scale of these columns. And as you can see, the, um, the very top of the tip of the dome was under construction. It was all wrapped up and I kept... So part of the other church we're going to see later was also kind of wrapped up. And I kept thinking that these churches are very smart and they're using protection, um, which is not a very respectful thing to be thinking, but um, there we are. Sometimes, sometimes things happen and you start thinking about steeple condoms and there you are. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so all of these stone, maybe granite, columns just huge huge and this so this church again totally different style totally different style from saint nicholas's and it's not a working church it's a museum sometimes very rarely they have services here but mostly it's a museum so I can take pictures, we took pictures of the inside. Totally different from the other um, Orthodox churches we went to. It felt much more like a Catholic church, much more like a big, overly opulent Western Catholic church. Um, which is probably because, again, Peter had a Western boner, and although this wasn't built under Peter the Great, um, it was St. Isaac was his patron saint, so they definitely had Peter the Great in mind when this was built. And it was built in 1858. Um, it's the, it is, doesn't just look big, it is the largest Orthodox Basilica in the world and the fourth largest cathedral. Um, I'm not sure from the phrasing of what I looked up if that's both Catholic and Orthodox cathedrals or just Orthodox cathedrals and it just wasn't very clear. But either way, it's a fucking huge church. It doesn't just look big, it is big. Um, some of the things that, some of the particular things you'll see here that are very unusual for an Orthodox church. Uh, first off, the, the art style is really different. Like, these, the fact that there's a lot of stuff on the walls, not just icons, but painting directly on the walls. That's not typical. That's not typical. Most In most of the other Orthodox churches I was in, you had framed icons and you had a lot of them and they were all over and maybe there were, you know, designs or, or painting Non, not terribly representational painting on the walls, but this kind of, these kinds of narrative scenes on the walls that are clearly not icons, but narrative scenes is very different. Um, and also, if you can see here, the statues, uh, the gold statues of angels or saints around the inside of the dome, that is super unusual for an Orthodox church. For the most part, orthodoxy does 2D images only, no 3D images, because that's getting like, awfully close to graven images. So 
We can do flat images, but not statues, not sculpture. So I was really surprised and I had to, I had to check in with our guide when I saw these and be like, wait, this is an Orthodox church, right? Are, are, we, are, are we sure about that? Are we totally sure? Um, so very different, really shows the, the uh, Western boner, the desire to, to fit in, to keep up with the, the rest of Europe, the Joneses. Um, talking about very different art styles, here's an example, which I'm guessing that this is um, supposed to be a representation of just post-nativity with Mary in bed and baby Jesus being rocked by someone, or, or maybe it's... Um, Nicodemus uh, seeing the baby Jesus, but then I'm not sure why Mary's still in bed. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what this is supposed to be. But point being, it looks much more like something that I would expect to see hanging in a Catholic church or even in a museum, a Western museum, than a... Russian or Greek style icon. It's not an icon. Um, so, again, very weird. Cool, but very weird. And then even, so this is an enlargement of, an enlargement and a freestanding um, representation of one of the panels in the iconostasis, which if you remember from Tallinn last week, that's the screen that separates the place the congregation is from the altar. Um, and there are doors there that open up at the, you open them up at the right point in the service and you can see the priests doing their consecration, all that. And so the iconostasis is always highly decorated with icons of saints. It's always um, the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary at, on one side, Jesus on the other side of the doors, and then other saints according to the church and the congregation's wants and desires um, on the rest of the on the rest of the screen. So this is an enlargement from the iconostasis in St. Isaac's. And even this, which is clearly supposed to serve the same function as an icon, is in a super Western style. Very Western, very Western dress, very Western um, facial representation, much softer, more naturalistic lines. In, in the tradition of iconography, of icon painting, icons are not supposed to be naturalistic. They're not supposed to be lifelike because then you're creeping up too far on um, that no graven images prohibition. They're supposed to be idealized representations, not something that you could ever see a living person in. So, so it's a very clear departure and in some ways, I'm a little bit surprised that, I mean, when you're emperor, when you're a czar, you can get away with a lot, but I'm still a little bit surprised that church authorities kind of permitted all of this. It's, it seems very different from what I saw and, and what I have heard about Orthodox pract praxis uh, from my, my friends here. So a little bit of a wider shot, because I did want to give you both a sense of the scale and to let you see 
see some of the iconostasis here. So if you see the columns, the, the green columns here, um, those are the columns on the iconostasis. This big screen wall. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Matricula, though, I, I had hopes. I had hopes. And who knows, maybe, maybe I won't talk as long as I thought as I think I'm going to, but like, there's, there's no way I'm getting through all this in one week. No way. <laughs> so, so that, that wall there full of, of panels of saints with the green columns, that's the iconostasis. No like little thin screen. This is a full on floor to ceiling wall. And those green columns, are columns covered in malachite. Did you hear that, Lee? Malachite. Columns of malachite. Um, which was pretty impressive, honestly. Um, it was amazing. And then the smaller blue columns, which we'll see up close in just a second, are covered in lapis lazuli. Super. No, don't eat malachite and don't use malachite dildos either. Um, the internet has conclusively decided that that is also very bad for you. But on church columns, totally okay. Um, there's also a ridiculous amount of malachite. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a ridiculous amount of malachite in the Hermitage, and we'll see some of that next week, too. But yeah, it's just mind-blowingly opulent. I didn't like this church very much, but it was really impressive. Um, yeah, so, so there we go. Then I promised you an up close. So here you can see the lapis lazuli columns. These are the smaller ones. And the doors that open into the altar. You can see through into the altar room. And for those of you who are actually watching, you can you can see um, that behind the altar area is this huge, huge stained glass Jesus window. Which, another thing that Orthodox churches don't have a lot of is stained glass. Mosaics, yes. Icons, yes. Stained glass, no. Our, our, our guide even mentioned this is really unusual for Orthodox churches. Um, but trying to be Western, trying to keep up with the rest of Europe. Um, and yeah, Lee, I know, I know people will put anything of the right shape in anywhere. And yes, yes, Matricula, our Jesus is bigger than your Jesus. In Russia, our Jesus is so much bigger, so much bigger. Um, <laughs> Yeah, okay, okay. Column envy is a thing too, Lee. That's that's okay. We can we can permit that. Um But yeah, and so you can't really see it here and we couldn't get close enough for a good picture. But Jesus' face is a little unsettling in this in this stained glass window. Like honestly a little unsettling. It's, it's a very It's not fair of me to say Rasputin -y because this obviously predates Rasputin. But it's a little Rasputin y in that like penetrating glare kind of way. Um and I I just I just I'm grateful that I'm not seeing the doors open on that 
big Jesus energy every Sunday is all I'm saying. That's all. Um, yeah. So next church, final church, but we're going to spend some time here too. Um, this is the church of our savior on spilled blood. Long name, long ass name. It is also ridiculously gorgeous. Like, this is the, um, this is the fairy tale castle of Russian Orthodox churches, I feel. What with the, the highly ornamented domes and you can only kind of tell in this picture, but there's mosaic work all over the outside of it. Um, pictures in the bigger spaces and some of the smaller squares, their coats of arms of the people who donated to make this church happen. Uh, just ridiculous. On, on our city tour, we stopped here, not to go in, but just to look at, look at the outside, take pictures of the outside. And there's plenty to look at outside. But I was so glad, I was so, so glad that we made a point of going on the tour that did let us go inside. And you'll see why in just, just a second. Um, again, like St. Isaac's, part of the, part of the spire is um, under repair, so it's, it's all wrapped up for safety. Um, I just, I just, church condoms. I mean, I guess when Immaculate Conception is a thing that can happen, you have to be extra super careful. So, let's move here. And this one, this one is also not a, um, not a working church. It's tourist attraction, um, museum. They do a very occasional service or two in here, but for the most part, it's not a working church, which to some degree is disappointing to me, but also I can see why you wouldn't want it to be, to be a working church. So a little bit of detail on the outside here, just, just to get a, just to get a little bit of more of an up close view and see all the detail that went into this. Um, all that gold trim, all those designs, we've got some of that, uh, kind of petally arches, you know, like, like we saw on Nevsky Cathedral, um, going up to the domes, just really gorgeous. I maintain that I like Nevsky Cathedral better because it's not over the top and all works really well together but <laughs> doesn't stop this from being super impressive and amazing um and then inside no not inside yet one quick shot of of some of the mosaic work on the outside last week at the cathedral in Tallinn we we saw um, a representation of Veronica's Veil, and here we are again, told you it was relatively common, with, I believe, um, Mary in blue on the left, and probably St. John in green on the right, looking at, looking at the angels holding up the veil. And this kind of detailed portrait mosaic work it's all over the outside and all over the inside because you see where other churches would be 
paint it and maybe have a couple of mosaics or maybe uh, maybe you know just be have hung icons our savior on spilled blood is covered in mosaics inside covered I mean the walls the pillars the ceiling the domes everything all this picture these pictures here all of these pictures they are not paintings they are not paintings they are not frescoes they are little bits of stone glued together and then glued on the wall they are mosaics um, it is absolutely breathtaking just mind-blowing in there uh, and I was so grateful that we could take pictures and I was so grateful that we were we were pretty much the first ones in there we got early entry because of our tour arrangements and that was incredibly valuable to be able to grasp the size and the scale of the place um, to see the open space there it was amazing but this this little um this little uh canopy shelter thing is right at the back of the church and now when i heard the name church of our savior on spilled blood I thought, oh, it's, you know, the Russian, you know, Russian dramatics, right? Or not, not dramatics, but sense of, um, sense of somber bleakness and all is tragedy and despair and long dark winters. I thought it was just a convention, but no, this church was built on the spot that um, Emperor Alexander II was fatally wounded by political dissidents, and this little little shelter, little tabernacle, I guess, covers the spot where his blood was actually shed. So, it is quite literally the Church of Our Savior on spilled blood. Um, oh, good. Yay. <laughs> Which, by the way, for those of you who may not know or may not be, be looking, um, my background music is by Elizabeth Lane, who is Lizard, Eat, Lizard Eats Flies on Twitch. And she has very kindly... Um, allow me to use it and I feel like it I feel like it suits the kind of thing I do very well um, and you should go check her out and throw her lots of love and support and money so um, so yeah that's what this little this little doohickey is about assassination and here's the bottom of it where you can see that behind behind that little golden gate area is not um, it's not the finished floor of the rest of the cathedral, which is very impressive, and we will see more of in a minute. It's the ground, it's the uh, the pavement of the square, the original square where this happened. Okay, so it's a little memorial um, to the assassination of Emperor Alexander II. And it's kind of weird um, the way that the 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 church and state ties here. I'm not a fan of the kind of divine right level 
of, of church-state connection that that happened with the that the SARS accreted to themselves. Um, I do not think that's healthy. I do not think that's good. I do not think that's theologically sound. However, it is what it is, and it's right here. So, on to happier and more um, more awe-striking things. This is just just to give you an idea of the scale and to let you know that I'm not bullshitting you when I say that this whole thing is fucking covered in mosaics. And not just, just, not just, um, like, geometric patterns. Nope. Narrative portraiture. Narrative portraiture in little bits of stone. That's what we have going on here. Saints and scenes from the Bible. And, I mean, yeah, some, some trim, too. But... A lot of people, a lot of clothes, a lot of shading, all in little bits of stone, which I think a lot of the time that I was in there, I just kept turning to my spouse and being like, how, how does, I don't understand, how does this work? This is amazing. Thank you. So it's, it's pretty breathtaking. Um, then another view, so some of it is you know, more geometric patterns, more some of the little alcoves were less on the people, more on the, the decorative side. Um, just to give you an idea of the different styles that were included. There were a whole bunch of narrative details, different specific pictures that I could have picked out, that I could have showed you. But this one in particular made me stop up short and go, uh, is, wait, what? What is going on? So, to the best of my admittedly limited understanding, what I'm seeing here is Moses with the burning bush, with Theotokos, Virgin Mary, appearing to him in a cloud of smoke and angels. I do not remember that part of the burning bush story. I do not remember it being um, you know, New Testament Mary Theotokos being the voice speaking from out of the bush. And I'm really interested and I have no idea. I have no idea if this is one weird choice on, on the part of the artist or um, if this is backed up by some interesting point of orthodox theology, or if I'm totally misreading this and it isn't the burning bush at all, and it's something different, some other person who was having a vision of the Theotokos, or if I'm misreading it, it's not the Theotokos at all, but like representation of Orthodox equivalent of the Metatron, the, the voice of God. I don't know. I have no idea. But yes, material, it looks really badass. I am a huge fan of the Ring of Angels with all the wings. Um, And I kind of like the idea of 
Moses seen through time and space and or Mary like peering through time and space to look back to Moses and speak to him. Um, I, I dig the biblical time traveling. So we're going to go with that. But yeah, super badass and a really good example of all the detail that went into the mosaic. Um, all the shading, all the fire and the twisty wood bits there, and the shaded angel wings. Stone! Little bits of stone! I just... I don't even know. I don't even know, y'all. So good. And just in case, just in case you forgot the cardinal rule in any gorgeous old church, which is always look up and always look down, I have looked down for you and seen the floor, which is a much larger scale stonework thing. And, I, oh. and this in particular, this picture would not have been possible if we had been 15 minutes later, maybe even 10, excuse me, minutes later, getting in the door. Would have been covered with people. Um, but just amazingly gorgeous stonework. I loved the colors here. Huh. I. I, I feel kind of bad because this stream is a lot of me gushing and not a lot of me being smart, but just, I just look at this, look at this. I don't have much to say except how fucking cool this is. Um, but so Bringing it back a little, bringing it back a little. This is the iconostasis. And as you can see here, it looks much more like, um, like a bigger, fancier, more ornate version of the picture we saw of the inside of the Tallinn Cathedral. It's got that, got the kind of onion shaped curvatures on top to it. Um, the Atokos on the left, Jesus on the right, doors in the middle, doesn't go all the way up to the ceiling. So again, much more typical for Russian Orthodox style. Um, very unlike St. Isaac's. And frankly, I like this a lot better, a lot better personally. Um, our guide asked us what we thought the light colored portions, the, those columns in the front and the, the top portion of the iconostasis was made of. And I said, you know, a really light colored wood. She was like, oh, well, that's, that's a good guess. No, ivory. Which, not crazy about that, but I shouldn't be surprised because when um, it seems, and we'll see more of this next week too, when the Tsars went all out, they went all fucking out. Just, no expense spared, no material too rare. You want your lapis lazuli columns, you got them. You want, you know, a forest full of huge red marble columns, no problem. Ballroom covered in gold, sure. Econostasis of ivory, we can do that. So, in some ways, the, the extreme opulence of a lot of what I saw in St. Petersburg was, was just not quite my style. Um, impressive but almost off-putting in its impressiveness to some degree 
So, yeah, that's an, that's an interesting balance to strike. Like, I'm really glad I saw it all, but in some ways I liked a lot of other things better. But anyway, very pretty. Very pretty iconostasis. And then, as I said, always look down, always look up, because Ceiling Jesus is watching you. Um, Ceiling Jesus is watching you, and this is another example of the kind of like penetrating stare Jesus, who I'm pretty sure is fairly disappointed with me for something, although I'm not really sure what. And uh, it, it was it was a little disconcerting to look up and like oh. Hi. Yes. Oh. Hmm. Was I was I doing something wrong? Um, it was also a little hard to look up that far and convince your eyes to focus and not get dizzy, not get a little vertigo going on, and you know, keep your balance. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm tricky. Lordy was. <laughs> It was a lot to take in, um, a lot to deal with, but at the same time, like so much prettiness, I had to, I had to bear with it and I had to try. And you can see, um, this is also nice because you can see on the, on the arches, on the columns, on the, on the curvature of the arches, just, you know, little, little saint portraits all over, all in a line. I didn't really see any that looked like exact repeats. There wasn't like a pattern, just lots of saints, all of them, all over. So it's a lot, it was a lot. And then the other particular uh, mosaic portrait or scene that I really loved was this one. I think, and again, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that what we are seeing here is the Immaculate Conception. Um, the Spirit of God descending as a dove to impregnate Virgin Mary. Might just be the Annunciation, but I have a feeling those two things happened pretty, uh, Pretty closely together. Yes. Yes. Dinale. Very Zeus. Very Zeus. Um, now to be fair, this is this is substantially more metaphorical and less canonical. This is all the all the Bible actually said is, is the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. The the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. Anyway, um doesn't specify in what animal form. Uh, this is this is conflating other times when the spirit of the Lord is is depicted or referred to as a dove. But yes, yes, very golden, golden shower, animal representation, hapless virgin. I, you know, all all the sky gods they they have a type. They have they have their signature moves. So there we go. But I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed the effect, especially in mosaic, of the golden rays and how they kind of peter out and get transparent as they get closer to Mary's head. Hey Crafty! Welcome! <laughs> you walked in at the Immaculate Conception. Hi! Um, and talking about possible, you know, possible ways that Zeus and uh, the first person of the Trinity shared um, game techniques. It's your third favorite conception. How many children do you have? Um, anyway, so 
<laughs> this was this was one of my favorites. Um, haha, I see. That's see. That's what I thought. Crafty. It's like third favorite. Yeah, yeah. Two children. So, right. And um, for the botanists in the house, Matricula. You can see that Mary is surrounded here by lilies emphasizing her great purity even as the Spirit of the Lord is coming all over her. Uh, just in case there was any concern or confusion. So, like I said, there was a lot in here. I could show you just a lot more pictures. Um, but the other one that I wanted to be sure to share. So this was, this was kind of a little, so Catholic churches have side chapels, right? And we've seen that in previous streams. We have the, the main altar area in the center and then side chapels around it. Um, this was kind of the equivalent of that here. It was off to the, off to the left of the main iconostasis, the main altar area. It was kind of a, a small side iconostasis in front of a little chapel type thing, which you can, you can see here. But the, the thing that set it apart and left me wanting to, to show it to you, um, the portrait in the middle of this kind of red wood iconostasis is Alexander Nevsky, the married monk saint, martial leader that we met last week in Tallinn, who gave his name to the cathedral in Tallinn. And this portrait um, shows him kneeling, praying in front of an icon. It's looking, looking very devout and also approachable. Excuse me. Um, and I thought it was interesting. So everyone, everyone has local saints, um, well, all Catholic countries and all uh, Orthodox countries, you, know, you have the saints that are where you're from or close enough. Hi, Steve from Utah. We've been talking about, um, we've been talking about churches and canals in St. Petersburg today. And we are looking at a pretty cool little little side chapel from the Church of Our Savior on Spilled Blood. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Really amazing architecture in St. Petersburg, Steve. Um, exactly right. So, <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of ugly block buildings too, Steve. You are, you are exactly right on about that. Um, I did not take pictures of, the, pictures of those. Jamie took a few pictures of those. I did not put them in this stream. <laughs> they are not what I want to be talking about. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting as we were going through the city to see the very modern and mostly substantially less interesting architecture right up against um, the much older and much more interesting architecture. So it's a, it's a balance, it's a balance. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the contrast can help you appreciate it. It can also, I don't know, in some ways it made me a little sad. Um, I have not been to Lodz. I, I'm not even sure I know where Lotz is, Steve, unfortunately. Where is that and, and what was it like? Oh, in Poland. 
Lots is in Poland. Excellent. I've never been to Poland. Not even a little. Um, I, I take it you have, though. So they took the old communist block buildings and got street artists to decorate them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So if they'd been doing that in St. Petersburg, I feel like I would have really appreciated that. Um, but no, the, the old Soviet architecture was just kind of clearly running down and getting kind of decrepit and it made me sad to look at. Um, I think putting murals on those buildings would be an excellent plan. <laughs> excellent. But, but yeah, so one last photo. Because I can. Um, again, so this, so off to the from the direction we're facing, off to the left, is our Savior on Spilled Blood, the, the church we were just looking at. But right across the street from it is this little trio statue of what looks like uh, Lady Hermes with, with her caduceus, Lady Apollo with her lyre, and the third the third figure around the side where we can't see i don't remember what she was but it was clearly like a trio of um feminine representations of gods and cool elaborate church lady gender swapped God figures. Cool. So that kind of that kind of just juxtaposition of um, classical influence and with the Orthodox culture was was interesting to me. So Steve, you've heard it described as the spiritual triumvirate. Um, I don't know either. I don't know either. Oh. Crafty, so it's across the street from the church, on the building across the street. It's not in the church architecture itself, but it's just, it's just you know, like, cross a little bridge. Um, Steve, I will say that in, in my wanderings, I've seen a lot of kind of three or four paired feminine figures. Um, often, often in similar arrangements, there's often like a strength, a sciences, a culture, um, different representations. And I think what they're actually doing in the ones that I've seen in, in civic circumstances, um, I think they are less, as much as I joke about it, less gender-swapped gods and more kind of idealized civic virtues. Um, so, like, Lady Lady Hermes is probably actually idealized like, trade and communication. Um, crafty, yes, there is a lot of classical influence in St. Petersburg because um, we were talking about this at the very beginning of the stream, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm uh, I'm so sorry, y'all are hopping in at the at the very end. But um, we talked about this at the beginning, and because as Matricula said, Peter the Great had a big old boner for Western European culture, and he as the as the architect as the founder of St. Petersburg desperately wanted um to show the rest of Europe that Russia's good Russia can be civilized Russia can be uh, uh can keep up with the Joneses and be very European 
so European. You want us at all your parties. Um, so he hired, he hired European architects and designers and one of the, one of the, one of the other churches we looked at, St. Isaac's, which is the largest Orthodox Basilica in the world, um, looks much more like a Western Catholic church than, um, than a Russian Orthodox church. Steve, so to put it very bluntly, bastardized yet romanticized idea of Western glory. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know that bastardized is fair. They, I think they were pretty faithful. Um, but it definitely, to some degree, came at the expense of Russianness, if that makes sense. Which is funny, because in other circumstances, Russia definitely wanted to impose Russian culture and, and way of life on the people that they conquered. Like, when we were in Estonia last week, we were talking about the idea of Russification and the way that the Russian Empire wanted to crush Estonian national identity and promote um, Russian assimilation and culture. So it's, it's an interesting balance, but they definitely went through a period of, of wanting to make themselves over as um, being acceptably Western. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd think of it less as, as a parody and more as um, the kid, the outsider kid in middle school who hasn't yet learned that it's really cool to be different and just desperately wants to make themselves over in the popular kid's image. So comes to school one day dressed in, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the kids are wearing these days, um, but comes to school one day in his impression or her impression, their impression of what the popular kids look like. And it might be very faithful, um, but also to some degree not very true to their own preferences and and their own personality. Um, but definitely a romanticized image of what it means to be Western, what what civilization is. Yeah, yeah, so living living out their their own ideal, taking that ideal, um, taking this image of what they want to be and living it out. Um, and Steve, I think this is the first time I've seen you on one of my streams. I'm, I'm not sure if you know the other people in chat, but we're, it, it was really good to see you and thank you for the wonderful questions. I'm sorry that, I'm sorry that I'm wrapping up now. Um, but if you, if you don't know the other people in chat, um, it'd be, it'd be awesome if you checked them out because they're amazing. Oh, lizard eats flies. You just got here too. Please do, please do. Yeah. Um, and, um, since this is my first time seeing you, here are some of some of the resources with some of the things that I do as well. Um, I will be, and for Lizard Eats Flies and for for all the rest of y'all, um, I'll be streaming again on Thursday at seven o'clock Eastern, 
and that'll be so Steve I do I do two kinds of streams currently um, yes crafty on Thursday I will be doing tarot um, not exactly sure what in specific I'll be doing but but we'll be doing something we'll be looking at some cards and talking about some things and doing tarot and then well I, I don't think of it so much as fortune telling Steve, but I would be happy to give you a reading um, if you're available then. be more than happy to give you a reading. I thoroughly enjoy giving readings on stream and it's good practice for me to, um, to try that. Awesome! Well, I will, I will look forward to seeing you then, right around 7 on Thursday. And we'll do a reading for Steve, and then maybe we'll look at some court cards and talk about that because I've been, I've been having thoughts and I want to do that. And Lee, 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 everyone should go check out Lee's jewelry too. Um, Dinole Designs on Etsy. Uh, she makes just gorgeous things, so many gorgeous things. So, it is that time when we should find someone to go mini-raid. Um, does anyone have suggestions? I'm not seeing a lot of, I'm not seeing many people I know on. Um, any suggestions for who we should, who we should go raid, who we should go visit? If not, I can just, we can just sign off here. But thank you all so, so much for being here. Thank you, Crafty and, oh, Liz Singer's on, cool. So there's my raid call for those of you who want to come, who would like to come raid along with me. One of these days, I'm going to be able to copy my own fucking raid call. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um. <laughs> so, we're going to go raid Liz Singer. And I hope to see you all Thursday. Or if not, next week when we will be in St. Petersburg again and thank you thank you crafty thank you Dina Lay for hanging out thank you Steve for all the great questions thank you Matricula thank you Liz um, for the music and for, for popping in it's always good to see you and we are gonna we are gonna go raid and I will see y'all soon.